This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. And we're excited to hear from our associate member, uh, Mike Markowitz, who has been one of the most active attendees of long tables over the course of the past 81. Um, and we're really excited to hear from him about uh, coins from the works of Shakespeare. Um, he's a, you know, an active member of the society, but also a regular contributor um, for, for Coin Week and other publications. So we're really, really excited to hear um, what he's got to, to share for today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Austin. Let's begin. At certain times and places in history, the social, cultural, and economic factors come together in just the right balance to produce an extraordinary outburst of intellectual creativity. Athens in the time of Pericles, Florence in the Italian Renaissance, Berlin in the 1920s might be cited as examples. Elizabethan London was surely such a time and place. And today what I'd like to talk about is how the coinage of that era was reflected in the plays of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare, who lived from 1564 to 1616, was born in the sixth year of the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the 31st year of her life. He died in the 13th year of the reign of James I. England's circulating coinage during Shakespeare's lifetime included 11 different denominations in silver, often rather debased silver, and nine denominations in gold, usually pretty good gold. There was no copper or bronze token coinage in uh, Shakespeare's uh, time. And, but many uh, contemporary French, Italian, Spanish, and Dutch types uh, circulated in uh, England and are mentioned in the plays. But first, a brief excursion into my first love, ancient numismatics. In the play Julius Caesar, there is a puzzling reference to the ancient Greek coin, the drachma. The drachma is a silver coin of about 4.3 grams. It's Greek, not Roman. The Roman silver denarius at the time was a silver coin substantially lighter. Although um, some critics consider this reference a historical error. But Shakespeare's source for this is apparently the historian Appian of Alexandria, who lived from 95 to 165 CE. And he's very specific about Caesar's bequest. To every Roman still living in the city, he gave 75 Attic drachmas. Let me set the scene for you. Julius Caesar has been stabbed to death in the Senate house and his bloodstained corpse has been brought out into the forum where a crowd has gathered. The assassins have given Caesar's protege, Marcus Antonius, permission to make a brief funeral oration, which is one of the great set piece speeches in all of English literature. Antony speaks. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet, tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. And the crowd goes wild. The will, the will, we will hear Caesar's will. Antony continues, have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. 
it is not meat you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men and being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, oh, what would come of it? And he continues, here's the will and under Caesar's seal to every Roman citizen he gives to every several man, 75 drachmas. That would be about three months wages for a laborer, a fairly significant amount. But of course the Attic drachma did not circulate in uh, Rome at the time of Caesar. Uh, here's an example, in fact, of the coin that uh, some historians say is what got Caesar killed, um, in, in which his title appears as dic, Dict Perpetuo, Dictator for Life. Now, to conservative elite Romans, much as to contemporary Americans, the idea of depicting a living person on the circulating coinage was abominable. And yet here it is. Um, this is quite a rare coin. Um, and uh, I tracked down um, the, the source in uh, Suetonius. Populo Hortos Circa Tiberium Publice et Veritim Trecenos Sesturios. Uh, to the people, he left his gardens near the Tiber for their common use and 300 sesterces to each man. Romans of this era uh, commonly uh, expressed large sums of money in terms of the humble bronze sesturtius rather than the silver denarius or the gold aureus. And um, so I think the reason that Shakespeare said drachma rather than denarius is that it sounded more archaic. And of course the uh, English silver penny for which the abbreviation was D for denarius right, um, would have been, uh, if Shakespeare had said to every several man 75 pence, that just wouldn't have sounded ancient Roman. Turning, oops to the ducat of Venice. In The Merchant of Venice, the moneylender Shylock has this speech, my daughter, oh my ducats, oh my daughter, fled with a Christian, oh my Christian ducats. Justice, the law, my ducats and my daughter. Venice dominated Mediterranean trade in the Middle Ages and well into the Renaissance. Introduced in 1284 and minted until the end of the Venetian Republic in 1796, the Venetian ducat was a gold coin of 3.5 grams, 23 and three quarters carats fine. Uh, in uh, decimals, that's 0.9896, quite pure gold, about as pure as the technology of the time could get it. And here is a contemporary example from the lifetime of Shakespeare. Um, Shylock, um, the Jewish moneylender, laments his daughter's theft of his sealed bags of ducats. On these Christian ducats, the obverse shows St. Mark handing a banner to the kneel kneeling figure of the doge, the uh, uh, chief magistrate or ruler of Venice. And on the reverse, we see the image of Christ in glory, 
surrounded by stars, surrounded by a rhyming Latin couplet, sit tibi Christe datus, quod tu regis, iste ducatus. May it be given to thee, O Christ, this duchy which you rule. So Shylock is quite correct in describing this coin as a Christian ducat. Uh, central to the plot of the play is Shylock's loan of 3,000 ducats to the merchant Antonio, guaranteed by a pound of Antonio's flesh. At uh, current bullion values, 3,000 ducats would be about 340 troy ounces of gold or uh, over half a million dollars. The Cruzado, referenced in the play Othello. Believe me, I had rather have lost my purse full of Cruzados. In 1373, the kings of England and Portugal signed a treaty of perpetual friendship, uh, which is uh, considered by some authorities to be the longest continuously standing treaty in force in the world. Trade between these two kingdoms flourished thanks to the English fondness for port wine. And the Cruzado was a Portuguese gold coin of about 3.8 grams, first issued by King Afonso IV, who ruled from 1438 to 1481. Uh, he hoped to finance a crusade against the Turks. As a Moor native to North Africa, Othello would have been familiar with the rich sources of West African gold that were exploited by the expanding Portuguese empire. The Ecu a la Couronne, or crown, a uh, shield with a crown. In Henry V, the king uh, give this speech before the great battle. Indeed, the French may lay 20 French crowns to one, they will beat us. But it is no English treason to cut French crowns. And tomorrow the king himself will be a clipper. What is he talking about here? Um, the weight and value of this coin, which was issued from 1385 to 1640, varied over time. The obverse bears uh, France's royal coat of arms, the shield with three lilies or fleur de lis, topped by a crown. The uh, Latin inscription on the reverse, Christ conquers, Christ reigns, Christ rules. Clipping the edges of gold coins in order to sell the clippings was a common but very illegal medieval practice. And clipping coins that bore the king's image was punishable as treason, a very serious crime. The quart decu, or in English, that's said as cardicu, is mentioned in All's Well That Ends Well. This is a substantial silver coin. Um, it was valued at one quarter of the gold ecu. Uh, the romantic comedy All's Well That Ends Well, uh, first performed in 1603, is set in France. So this reference to a contemporary French coin is quite appropriate. We come to the penny. And there are many, many references in the plays to the penny. Here's a penny of Elizabeth. During Shakespeare's lifetime, the basis of the British monetary system was the silver penny, plural pence. Uh, two pence was normally the pri price of a loaf of bread in London. 
in Shakespeare's Globe Theater, a penny paid admission for the groundlings who stood in the courtyard around the stage. The elite uh, sitting up in the galleries would pay six pence for their seats. 12 pence make a shilling, 20 shillings make a pound. This is the British monetary system right down until decimalization in 1971. Uh, the pound was an accounting unit rather than a physical coin until the first gold pound or sovereign was issued in 1578. Originally, the weight of the penny was defined as one penny weight or one twentieth of a troy ounce, 1.55 grams. Under Henry IV, the penny fell to 15 grains, 0.97 grams, and it dropped to uh, 12 grains, 0.78 grams, in 1464 during the reign of Henry VI. By the time of Elizabeth I, the penny was a wretched little piece that was struck in a debased alloy less than half silver, weighing six tenths of a gram or less. The half penny, right, uh, was uh, only about 230 milligrams, less than the weight of an aspirin tablet, which is 350 milligrams. And uh, this half penny of James I bears the heraldic rose symbolic of England on the obverse and the thistle symbolic of Scotland on the reverse because James was simultaneously James the first of England and James the sixth of Scotland. Um, this example looks to be clipped a bit. Um, the milled sixpence. The handsome milled sixpence of Elizabeth the first was issued between 1561 and 1572. It was the first English coinage made with the screw press rather than hand hammered. The French mint master, Eloi Mestrel, imported the machinery from Paris and set up a workshop in the Tower of London. The quality of the coins was excellent but production was slow compared to hand hammering. Resistance from the mint workers who feared the loss of their jobs eventually led to Mestrel's downfall and execution in 1578 for counterfeiting. It would be another century before coining machinery was adopted in England. Now here is a very complicated reference to the shilling. Pistol, did you pick Master Slender's purse? I by these gloves did he of seven groats in mill six pences and two Edward shovel boards that cost me two shilling and two pence a piece. The Merry Wives of Windsor, Act One, Scene One. This is one of Shakespeare's most obscure coin references. The groat was a silver coin valued at four pence. The Edward shovel board was a shilling of the boy king Edward VI, who briefly ruled from 1547 to 1553. Struck in very low relief by the time of Shakespeare, these corn coins had worn down smooth and flat, making them perfect for the tavern game of shovelboard, which involved sliding coins across a table. 
So these old coins were highly prized by players and they sold at a premium. And you can see in this example, right, that uh, these coins uh, took a great deal of wear and tear in circulation. So they did indeed wear flat. The noble. A noble shalt thou have and present pay and liquor likewise will I give to thee and friendship shall combine and brotherhood, Henry V. The noble was a large thin gold coin valued initially at six shillings and eight pence or do the math 80 pence or one third of a pound. It was first issued by Edward III in 1377, and it was last issued under Edward IV in 1464. By Shakespeare's time, the gold angel had replaced it. The weight gradually fell from about nine grams to less than seven. The obverse bears a figure of the king standing in a ship a car holding a shield with the royal arms. The reverse bears an elaborate cross and many references to this coin in Shakespeare's plays play on both meanings of the word noble as the name of a gold coin and as a quality of a person. The angel, is referenced uh, in The Merchant of Venice when Shylock says, they have in England a coin that bears the figure of an angel stamped in gold. And on the obverse of this angel of uh, Queen Elizabeth, we see the figure of my namesake, Saint Michael the Archangel stabbing the fallen dragon symbolizing Satan uh, around uh, the rim, uh, Elizabeth, by the grace of God, Queen of England, France, and Ireland, because the English kings still pursued that claim to the French throne. On the reverse, we see the ship and the ar royal arms with the Latin inscription, uh, the Lord has done it, and it is wonderful in our sight. Uh, so the um, references in Shakespeare often play on the double meaning of the word angel as a gold coin and a divine messenger. The crown also is uh, often the subject of a play on words. Originally, it was a gold coin issued under Henry VIII, valued at five shillings. Although small quantities continued to be issued in gold until the reign of Charles I, it was best known as a heavy silver coin that was first struck under Edward VI in 1551. And here we see the gold crown, well, less than three grams in uh, an issue of Elizabeth I. The Harry 10 shillings is another one of these rather complex and obscure references in the plays. Henry IV reigned from 1399 to 1413. There were no 10 shilling coins during that time. So Shakespeare is making a uh, contemporary reference that would be familiar to his audience. The Harry 10 shillings was a 23 karat gold coin subsequently falling to just 20 carats, uh, that Henry the first first issued in, uh, Henry the eighth issued in 1544. Um, 
since the French crown, the couronne, circulated at a value of four shillings, the sum that's described here in the play would have been 10 crowns. Uh, Elizabethans often needed to make some, these exchange rate conversions. Uh, and think about it, no coins in this era bear any inscription or number that says what they were worth. Um, it must not be forgotten that a majority of Englishmen in Shakespeare's day were illiterate. They might not be able to read the Latin inscriptions on their coins, but they knew all the designs intimately and were acutely aware of the proper size and weight as these were essential survival skills. Uh, David Alexander, senior numismatist for Stax, wrote that in the introduction to the catalog of the fixed price list, coins of Great Britain, coins in Shakespeare, a sale in the summer of 2006 that was a very useful reference for me in compiling this presentation. Talk about that a little later. I looked at some wages and prices in Elizabethan England. The weekly wages for one of Shakespeare's actors were only six shillings, but at least that often included free food. Shakespeare's first folio edition of his plays published in 1623 was originally sold for only one pound. Uh, these days, uh, when an edition comes to market, it will bring typically, uh, you know, a million dollars at auction. Uh, a plowman earned uh, about a shilling a week. It was a skilled trade because a plowman had to manage a team of oxen, whereas field workers who worked with uh, hoes and shovels got only two or three pence per week. Uh, a shepherd, because wool was extremely valuable as an export, uh, got six pence a week. As I mentioned, uh, the standard loaf of bread, which weighed about 24 ounces, uh, sold for tuppence. Uh, the weight uh, might vary, but the price was held steady. A chicken sold for a penny. A tankard of ale, which might be something between a pint and a quart, uh, in the uh, tavern, sold for a half pence. Um, sugar, an expensive import, sold for a shilling a pound, and a bottle of French wine for two shillings. Here's a chronology of uh, the subjects of the history plays. So you can see that Shakespeare was writing about what was a fairly remote past in, in reference to his own time. Although coins stayed in circulation often for a very long time. And um, 14th and 15th century coins might well still have been around or familiar to Shakespeare's audience. I mentioned these two books, um, Eric Engstrom, uh, when he was a student associate at Dartmouth College Museum, wrote this splendid and very well-researched numismatic guide to coins in Shakespeare, which I was fortunate enough to find a copy of um, for the uh, anniversary of Shakespeare's birth, the Dartmouth College Museum staged an exhibition of Shakespeare's coin, Shakespearean coinage, uh, presumably from the museum's own collection. And the most important sale in, in the last two decades 
of Shakespeare related coins was this fixed price list from Stax in the summer of 2006. Engstrom wrote, Shakespeare's works are rich in allusions to coins. Such references were meant to bring his audiences into closer identification with the play by mentioning a familiar aspect of life. The Elizabethan was familiar with many foreign coins, not only because of trade with the continent, but because for centuries, good gold and silver had no nationality or politics. A precious metal coin was never turned down because it was not English. Here are some of the references that I found uh, useful in putting together this talk. And with that, I would be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you for your kind attention. Excellent, thank you. And I just wanna also remind folks that if you don't have uh, uh, if you don't have a mic or if you just wanna put your question in the chat, I'm happy to read it out um, so that people can, can hear. Susan, did you wanna read your, your question out or I can read it out for you? Okay, she said, um, uh, uh, this is quite fascinating. I'm quite versed in uh, plantagenet history, but had not really studied coinage. Thank you for a very informative talk. The, uh, uh, the Coins of England book, which uh, is issued every year by, um, by Spink in London, is a great reference for the coinage of the Plantagenet era, uh, the Wars of the Roses, and um, really all of, of uh, English coinage back to uh, Celtic time, pre-Roman times. Oh, thank you, Mike. I, um, I come from Plantagenet, so I, you know, I'm very enthralled in their history because we were really pretty horrible. But um, our plays seem to turn out well, and um, I, I really must delve into this further. I really appreciate the, this talk. It's very fascinating. Thank you very much. I have a kind of random question. It's not necessarily about the coins, but on your list of, of what things cost, you said that a chicken costs twice as much as a loaf of, or a loaf of bread costs twice as much as a chicken. And I, that just surprised me. Do you know why that would be more? I mean, anyone could really. Um, because um, bread had to be baked often using charcoal, right? Which was an, a, a, a fuel that had to be brought into the city. The urban population lived on bread that was baked fresh every day, but without access to bake, bakers and bakeries, the rural population probably survived on porridge, boiled grain, uh, much more so than bread, which was almost something of a luxury uh, for the rural people. Interesting, yeah, I never thought about it. I was just like, you gotta feed the chicken for months before you can kill it and it's still cheaper than the bread, but. Yeah, uh, many of these coins that were, were I illustrated are, are scarce high value gold and silver types. So assembling a complete set of these would be a challenge for even the wealthiest and most patient collector. Um, hammered English coins, of course, are very popular with modern collectors. And these items do frequently appear in major um, British and American coin auctions. I was fascinated by the Edward shuttleboards. Uh, uh, were there other, um, you know, slang expressions like that that you uncovered? Uh, yes, the, uh, the Engstrom uh, booklet is uh, a, a gold mine of explanations of the most obscure references in Shakespeare's plays. 
I would love to see that. Hi, this is Eric. May I speak? Please. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. That was a great presentation. I wanted to say, too, that there's another wonderful book out that everyone should be familiar with. It's done by the British Museum called Angels and Beckets by Barry Cook. Beautifully illustrated book and well worth uh, getting and looking at. I wanted to say when I did my book as an undergraduate, it was inspired by the fact that we were fast approaching the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth. So I thought, well, this is a time to go back in the huge concordance that was available then, no computers, and meticulously go through by names of coins and find the references. That's what I did. There's an ANS connection then. When the book was published, we had this display at Dartmouth, Shakespeare medals, and it was through Henry Grunthal, a good friend. He sent the items to Dartmouth and we put them on display. And it was just an absolutely wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, uh, I'm not sure, Chuck Oliver asks if the instrument book, uh, booklet is available at the ANS library. We'll have to check Donum, the, uh, the, our database here to see if it's, if it's available. I guess I have more of a comment, um, but I'm, I'm just so curious about the rich history in English poetry and kind of plays in that, in that same context of, of coin references. I know that there's some very early references in, um, in the first run of the, of the American Journal of Numismatics. I was going back through some of the, the first you know, 20 or 30 um, issues and there's this kind of whole early s series about kind of poetry um, and numismatics and how you know, Chaucer is constantly using this sort of um, the super specific numismatic vocabulary because it would have been resonant. Um, whether or not it was accurate to the moment he was trying to depict, same thing for Shakespeare, but it, um, yeah, it is, it does shape the way that we kind of think about what, what is well, oh, something super, you know, fair, a, a big gold denomination or something like that. Um, like with the um, Shylock's reference as um, you know, my daughters and my duplets. I found the reference that uh, Eric mentioned to the book, Angels and Ducats, Shakespeare's Money, that British Museum publication. And I just put that in the chat. Oh, which I should put in the chat to everyone. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing it on my end. We also wanna make sure that sure. we put in your the article that your talk was based on. I, know, I don't know if people saw that at the very beginning, but I wanna put that link in as well for people to, to be able to, to go back and, and read. I just put that in the chat as well. Thank you. Jim McClellan, if you want. Oh, hi, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Jim McClellan and uh, I really appreciated this talk and I really learned a lot and just really fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm not a numismatist, and I know only one tiny little bit of numismatic history, and that concerns uh, jetons or counters that were used on counting tables. And you mentioned them at the beginning of your talk, and in the book I wrote on this same topic, I did find that Shakespeare in a number of plays mentions counters as well as, uh, as coins. And I can give a few references here. Um, in Cymbeline, for example, the hangman declares, your neck, sir, is pen bulk encounters. Uh, Iago, in the opening scene of Otello, the, derides an opponent, a great mathematician, is countercaster. A clown in the winter tales wonder how much his wool is worth. I cannot do it without counters. And then in Troilus and Cressida, weigh you the worth and honor of a king so great as our dread father on a scale of common ounces, Will you with counter sum the vast proportion of his of his infinite? And I think coins and counters are always sort of complementary in a way. And uh, now I learned about the other side that I didn't know about before. It's a really fantastic talk, and I want to thank you very much for presenting it today. Thank you. 
uh, jetons or, or counters were generally struck in copper or bronze or brass, and they often um, uh, copied the elaborate floral crosses that appeared on the high value gold coin reverses. Uh, when, when you, and they're highly collectible. Uh, by the way, there's one more counter uh, reference in Julius Caesar, I think it's Act 4, Scene 1, where they're arguing about the payment for gold as a reference to, I, you know, I cannot drop my blood for drachmas. And then there's a reference to uh, lock, uh, getting such rascal counters from my friends. So there are two coin references in Act 4, Scene 1, the famous fight. Tent scene, the, the argument between Brutus and Cassius. Thank so, you. And, and Jim, Jim McClellan mentioned that he's, he might not be a numismatist, but he just, we just published a book, an excellent book of, of his uh, jeton uh, donation to the society. And we'll put, um, we'll put that in, in the chat as well. Um, but I, um, I guess I have another kind of question or comparison to, um, there was uh, there's a, a reference in John Dunn where um, I, I mentioned that you were giving this talk to a friend who shared sort of the kind of the anti anti semitism that's so kind of baked into the way that Shylock is presented uh, and there's a reference in John Dunn where he says and how howsoever French kings most Christian be their crowns, their crowns are their circumcised crowns. most Jewishly. <laughs> yeah, and so you have this sort of same kind of clipping, this reference of clipping um, uh, that is kind of comparable to, to your reference from the one of the Henry plays. Excellent. I, I'm still confused about the counters. Uh, I thought there were no jetons in that period. Um, Quite the contrary, they're going to be jetons <clears throat> all the way through from uh, the 1200s, <clears throat> and many of them from, <clears throat> excuse me, Germany or or Holland or or, or France. I, I don't think that there were many manufactured uh, in England in in Shakespeare's time. I gather they were more important, but uh, Mr. Markovitz probably knows better than I do. Uh, that's a little outside my expertise. But, that, was, that was my impression. I knew there were on the continent there were jetons, but I'd never come across English jetons of that period. Uh, they were known as um, uh, abbey tokens uh, that they were called. They were used, you know, to keep accounts of various uh, abbeys and monasteries and things. And I dare say, although I'm not completely confident, it's also filtered down into uh, the rest of uh, keeping accounts. Uh, in uh, in English uh, 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 economy and society at the time. Thank you. Since we still have some time, I just I have a I uh, it went by so quickly when you were talking about the mint master who was executed in the Tower of London. I don't know if you can talk more about that because I remember the coin you had on the screen. I photographed quite a few of them and. I don't, I just, it sounded so fascinating. So he was literally minting out of the Tower of London counterfeit coins. Um, it, it was it was not unusual for mint employees to um, run off uh, a little extra uh, money on the side, you know. Um, uh, often at times that was even considered a benefit of, uh, of, of the job. Um, Seems risky. <laughs> uh, uh, producing hand hammered coins, right, required an enormous amount of physical labor and it employed large teams of, of, of workers. Whereas the introduction of, of first the screw press, then the rocker press, um, threatened to put these workers out of a job. So there was tremendous resistance to the introduction of coining machinery uh, right up until the time where that machinery came to be powered by steam engines. Um, 
Uh, we should note, though, that Mestrel's supposed crime of counterfeiting occurred some years after his his work at the Tower Mint was terminated. Ah. Mm. Good catch. Thanks. Also, uh, there was a uh, mint off, if you will, between Mistral and his press and the hammerers, and they had this contest as to who could uh, produce the most coins in a stated amount of time, and the hammerers at one. Sort of like the legend of John Henry and the steam hammer. <laughs> What is it a quality versus quantity thing? Like, were the hammered one like they made so many more, but how were they? Well, some of them were off center, I'm sure, but uh, <laughs> but I mean, you look at ancient coins were which are made at that in that method, and how many of them are perfectly centered? Not very. But milling was actually considered more of an anti counterfeiting measure at the time than it was an enhancement in appearance, mm -hmm. although, of course, it was much better. Mm -hmm. I, I can speak to the case in France uh, where the screw press, uh, you know, came in in the 1560s, but the official mints uh, maintained uh, hammering until the 1640s. And you know, it, was a, it was a union thing. Uh, they, they got it prescribed and the, uh, the screw press was only used uh, to make uh, jetons and counters, uh, and not uh, and not uh, official French coinage. Thank you. That's fascinating. I didn't look super closely at the 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 meter, but is it possible also that in addition to make maybe sounding sort of extra archaic, where the reference in uh, the using the Greek denominational term instead of a the some Roman or Latin um, term might have just worked well with the meter. I mean, any ancient coin, ancient ancient wealth thing plugged in that fit sort of maybe the meter of, of the line. Oh, because drachma, two syllables, denarius, more syllables. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Once again, thank you all for your kind attention. Um, and uh, if you'd uh, like a talk on the coinage of the Crusades, I have one ready to go. Thank Oops. you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.